Hello my friends and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 character building guide. Hope you're all doing well. We are in the home stretch with the level 5 spells, some of the most powerful spells in the game. By this point, we, you've seen a million spell tier lists from me so you know the drill. I will just quickly reiterate the tiers just so we're all on the same page before we start. So in S tier I have spells that you will always take and prepare if you have access to them. They're incredibly important to your character. In A tier we have spells that are usually build around spells that you take levels in a certain class to access that you're going to use very frequently in just about every combat or just about every adventuring day. In B tier spells we have spells that you're always happy to prepare and cast but maybe aren't ones that you build your character entirely around getting access to so they're great filler for your spell list and ones that you will use frequently but maybe a little less powerful overall or a little more situational overall than the A tier spells. In C tier we have narrow spells that either see use only for very specific contexts, like a certain encounter or a certain uh, specific character build, or spells that provide small amounts of value but not enough to justify using them regularly, only if they're something that you have for free or access to easily. And in D tier spells, I have spells that are ones that are weak and you typically want to avoid preparing them and casting. Once again, I've not included an F tier because I think there are very few spells in the game that are genuinely useless, although if there are a couple, which I will mention when we get to them, but overall I think that you can gain value from just about every spell, so it makes sense to consider them all as having some value. I am also recording this before having posted my level 4 spells tier list, so I will jump back and do adjustments based on community feedback uh, in a future video. As always, if you have things that you would like to see moved around, definitely let me know. I can and will move things based on the extremely valuable feedback that I get in the comments, so definitely let me know if there's a spell you think I've misplaced. Alright, let's jump in and talk about the spells, starting with Banishing Smite. Banishing Smite is one of the hardest to get spells in the game because it is a level 5 paladin spell, a 5th level paladin spell, meaning that you normally wouldn't get access to it until paladin level 17. Obviously that doesn't exist in Baldur's Gate, you only go up to level 12, so paladins can't get this spell. The only way to get it is through selecting it as a magical secret at bard level 10. So, the, so you need a significant investment, 10 levels in bard, which isn't bad obviously, but you need to have done that, and then also to spend one of your two level 10 magical secrets on this spell in order to get it. If you're a, uh, not a lore bard, that's also one of your only two magical secrets, meaning that it's very expensive to get access to this spell. So is it worth it? Vanishing Smite does is a smite attack like the other paladin smites, so you spend your bonus action and use it as an attack action to do an additional 5d10 of force damage, and then if the enemy is below 50 health, they get banished, just like the spell Banishment, which I talked about in the last episode. You can essentially think of that as tacking an extra 50 damage onto the spell if you get them below that threshold, because an enemy that's banished for two turns with no save, and there's no save against this, it works just if you hit them and they're below 50 health, um, is basically dead. You'll, you will then need to maintain your concentration on the spell for two more turns, but when they come back, you should have cleaned up the rest of the fight and be able to focus your full attention on taking away those last 50 hit points. So... It, you can think of it as essentially killing anything that's below 50 when, once you hit them with the spell. This spell is a core part of the maybe the single highest damage attack that you can possibly get if you are a uh, level 10 bard with a with two levels in paladin. Then you can make an attack using this and a fourth level smite for 5d10 force plus 5d8 radiant plus your normal attack. If you critically hit, then that does 10d10 force plus 10d10 radiant plus your normal attack. And 10d10 force from this spell is 55 average damage, plus if you get them below, uh, below 50, then it adds another 50-ish damage to that, or more or less does that. So you can kind of think of this spell as doing 105 average damage on a critical hit, which is an absurd amount of damage. Um, you can guarantee critical hits using Hold Person, which it will be easier to do because you're probably a Sword Bard, and you uh, can also, of course, get them from Luck of the Far Realms or the Killer Sweetheart. There's lots of other ways to get critical hits. So this spell does a ridiculous amount of damage and can be stacked with other things that do a ridiculous amount of damage to do some truly absurd numbers in a single round. 
Now, is that worth spending one of your magical secrets on? Bard magical secrets are very, very expensive and very valuable. So this spell is competing against some of the best spells in the game. In fact, all, all the best spells in the game, pretty much, because you could spend your magical secrets on Command, on Haste, on Counterspell, on Hunger of Hadar. So you really need to be getting a lot of value out of this spell in order to uh, cast it. If you're a lore bard, you also probably aren't making attacks. And so lore bards who have more magical secrets to spend and thus wouldn't care as much about uh, spending one on this spell slot are much less likely to be able to use it than swords bards who only get two. Uh, Valor bards just aren't really a thing, so I'm not considering them. Um, in that case, we have to judge it against some of the best possible spells in the game and ask, is this a incredible burst damage worth a spell slot? And the answer is, some of the time, I think it is. This is so much damage that for certain builds, this can be an incredible pick. Now, I think generally you're going to want a more... Um, a, a more general use utility spell out of your magical secrets. Counterspell and command and so on are, are really important to have in your in your character, uh, in your party. So if you don't have access to those from something else, magical secrets are very important to spend on spells like that. Um, but if you just want your character to maximize damage, then this is a good spell. Where to place it is actually kind of interesting because it already is only available to certain extremely narrow builds, so that kind of makes it like a marginal spell. Um, and I think the fact that it is both not terribly useful for lore bards, so only swords bards will want it, and is competing against some of the very best spells in the game, means that I'm going to place it in C tier, but it's worth mentioning that this spell, if you use it properly, does a ridiculous amount of damage, and so is a build-around spell that you can create a build based on this spell and have it perform very well. Cloud Kill. Cloud Kill is a spell that I confess I actually had not cast very often before I went to make this tier list and went to test it in game. Um, and it impressed me way more than I was expecting. It's a super weak spell in tabletop, and it didn't look like they'd changed the numbers or anything, so I was kind of expecting to just go, you know, it's con save, poison damage, which everything resists, not that much damage, uh, garbage, let's move on. But the spell has actually been changed in a couple ways, some intentional and some, I think, not intentional, that really increase the value of the spell significantly. So how Cloud Kill works is you create a, a it's a concentration-based AoE, 20-foot radius, which is pretty good, and it creates a cloud of heavy obscurement, much like Fog Cloud, that does 5d8 poison damage to everything that's in it. Um, However, it uses the same weird timing rules as Moonbeam or Cloud of Daggers or whatever, so you get the damage when you cast the spell initially and at the beginning of the character's of the creature's turn, meaning that it's not actually 5d8 damage, it's 10d8 damage. And unlike Tabletop Cloud Kill, which just rolls slowly away from you, uh, Baldur's Gate Cloud Kill, you can recast, like Moonbeam, anywhere within 60 feet of you, so it doesn't have to be near the previous location of the Cloud Kill. You can just place it again uh, every subsequent turn of combat, which, once again, does the initial damage and then the damage at the start of the character's turn. So you get to double dip on this damage every single turn, meaning that it basically lets you do an AoE 10d8 poison damage um, with a con save for half, or two con saves for half, uh, every single turn of combat, as long as you're maintaining concentration on it. Except that part is also not true, and here's what I think is a bug. If you lose concentration on this spell, you don't lose the ability to recast it. You can just keep recasting it. The, the cloud dissipates, but you can keep recasting the cloud every turn for free without spending an, a new spell slot on it. I'm pretty sure that's a bug and it may be fixed, but currently that's how it works, which means that you can lose concentration on this spell and still continue to use it for the rest of combat, which is unique amongst concentration spells and kind of cool. So the question is, with all of those changes, is this spell actually worth casting? Obviously, poison damage is extremely heavily resisted, so lots of enemies resist um, this damage type. Con saves are bad to target because enemies will typically have very high con saves, uh, and it is just a pure AoE damage spell, so even if it's doing decent damage, how good is it uh, to cast in general? Against enemies who are not immune, the amount of damage this does is pretty relevant, and this spell being easy to get immunity to actually does give you a couple extra bonuses. I created a build kind of based around this spell called the Mighty Fart Druid, which you can 
check out, because if you get poison immunity, you can stand inside your own cloud kill and force enemies to fight you inside the cloud kill. And because it's heavy obscurement, like fog cloud, if you use the hide action inside the cloud kill, then enemies won't be able to see you. Um, so you gain you have a free way to become basically invincible by hiding inside the cloud kill, and enemies will have to run in and search for you, taking the damage whenever they do so. So in that context of a character who's immune to poison, you can use it to fight in. Outside of the context of a character who's immune to poison, it's just a pretty solid damage spell with a lot more utility than you might think, because you can reposition it every single turn, and even losing concentration doesn't cost you the spell. So even if you take a hit and lose concentration, you get to reuse the spell. I think that this spell is still not great, because by the time you get to cast it, just about everything is immune to poison damage. But if you need a damaging effect in an encounter where things are not immune to poison damage, this spell's pretty good. So I'm going to put it in C tier here, because it won't come up that often. But as a late game damaging spell, it impressed me way more than I was expecting out of a level 5 spell slot. Cone of Cold. Cone of Cold is yet another 5th level damage spell, and this one does 8d8 of cold damage in a cone, a 30 foot cone, so you have to get kind of into the combat in order to affect enemies, with a con save for half. This being cold damage, of course, is very relevant in Baldur's Gate, because you can double it using the wet effect, meaning that while uh, without wet it does 36 average damage, 8d8 is uh, averages to 36, which would be terrible for a level 5 spell slot, even in an AoE. With the wet effect, it doubles to 72 average damage, which is much more respectable. Basically, without wet, this is worse than just casting Cloud Kill, uh, less damage, although a more relevant damage type. With wet, it's basically two turns of Cloud Kill packed into one turn, although you have to spend some amount of resources setting up the wet effect, depending on how your party is set up. Um, this also, of course, targets Khan, which holds it back, because, as I've mentioned many times, Constitution is a bad save to target, and it doesn't create an ice surface unless you have water on the ground, so the only time you're ever going to want to use this spell is if your party is set up to take advantage of wet effects. As just a spell that you would prepare and cast normally without having water on the ground to freeze and make an ice surface, without having enemies wet to double the damage. This spell is terrible. It's a, just a bad ratio that you have to be too close to enemies to use. Um, with those things, it's an okay spell, and so for parties that are focused around abusing the wet effect, I think this can uh, be a reasonable spell cast. Most of the time, honestly, I think you're still going to be better off with Hailstorm to create a giant ice surface without any setup, and it, the damage is worse, but not like that much worse. Um, and as a pure damage spell, there are way better options at of upcasted lower level spells or even at fifth level. So I think that this spell is also C tier just for its synergy with wet focused parties, but that's something that um, you should, you know, this, these two are maybe at kind of like the top level of C tier and this is at the bottom level of C tier because it is not even that great if you're doubling the damage, uh, which is not a place you really want to be when choosing and preparing a spell. Conjure Elemental. Conjure Elemental has eight different forms, and so it's an extremely versatile spell, and I think actually all eight of these forms do have some interesting uses, although some are a little bit better than others. If cast as a level 5 spell, you get an Elemental, an Air, Earth, Fire, or Water Elemental, and if cast as a level 6 spell, you get an Air, Earth, Fire, or Water Myrmidon. The best of these is actually the water at both levels. I think this is going to be the generically most useful one, so unless you have a specific use for something that one of the other elementals does, you're going to go with a water elemental or a water myrmidon, um, just because they have the most powerful abilities. I'll talk briefly about what those are. So the water elemental, the most important thing is that it has Winter's Breath, which does a... Uh, an AoE damage, which is pretty good, pretty decent AoE damage already, and with the ability to turn enemies brittle if they fail a con save. Brittle gives them vulnerability to thunder and bludgeoning damage, and vulnerability to bludgeoning damage is incredibly difficult to come by and absurdly powerful. Of course, if you have a way to deal bludgeoning damage, then doubling it is going to be extremely strong. And so the water elemental gives you a lot of combo potential there, while also just being a good way to apply ice surfaces and do a bunch of a reasonable amount of damage all by itself. Reasonably tanky summon as well. The water Myrmidon gives you a gigantic healing 
Vapor's aura, which creates a wet surface, a water surface on the ground, as well as for three turns healing every character within it for 2d8. Uh, healing. The healing is a reasonable benefit, but the ability to just create a 30-foot radius wet surface is incredibly strong. The water elemental, uh, because of course doubling cold and lightning damage with wet is ridiculous, having this gigantic water surface on the ground that you can freeze and knock everything over is ridiculously powerful as well. It also creates ice surfaces on its own with its missile attack and has both flying movement and free misty step making it incredibly mobile and thus also incredibly survivable because it can get away and position really easily in combat so you're very likely to be able to keep it active for the entire day um Overall, the versatility and power level of this spell, I think, means that it is incredibly strong, and one that you are going to use uh, very, very often on every character that has access to it. As always with summons, this is one where you have to, you know, enjoy microing the summons and not be mad when they get stuck behind corners. Although, since it's only one summon, and similar to Conjure Woodland Being, is a strong enough summon that if you just create it for one fight and then dismiss it after the fight, you've still almost certainly gotten a ton of value out of the spell. S tier spell and one that I definitely recommend. You should explore this spell further to see some of the other cool combos that you can do with every elemental aspect of the spell, but it would take me like half an hour to go over all of them, so I'll just mention that the two water summons are, in my opinion, the generically best, but all of them have their uses. Contagion. Contagion is another modal spell where you choose from six different options and it will defer in effect based on which option you choose. You can think of it kind of as an upgraded bestow curse where enemies will make a constitution saving throw or be afflicted with uh, a poisoned effect, so that gives them disadvantage on all their attack rolls and everything, and then they have to make successive con saves every single turn. If they fail three saves, they're afflicted with an, an additional debuff, but if they succeed three saves before they fail three saves, then you lose the contagion effect and it goes away. This taking a minimum of three turns, obviously, is a huge downside, and of course it's con saves and with all the problems that that has. Um, but just like Bestow Curse, this can be cast out of combat without aggroing NPCs, and so is sort of interesting in that respect. If enemies do fail the three saves and the debuffs apply, they are some brutal debuffs. You get to choose between enemies having vulnerability to all damage, doubling every single point of damage they take, or getting stunned every single time they take any damage, or becoming permanently confused, becoming hostile to everything, and, you know, acting randomly based on the effects of the confusion spell. This spell, obviously, in combat is terrible. Anything that takes is uncertain and takes a minimum of three turns to actually get its effect, not to mention that its melee is completely useless. Um, no combats are going to go long enough for Contagion to come up. However, these debuffs are so powerful, and the fact that you can cast it out of outside of combat does make it like mildly interesting. But even then, they have a lot of chances to pass the saves. Um, and also, it's worth noting that if you miss the attack roll to apply the uh, Contagion in the first place, they do aggro to you, whereas if you hit the attack roll, they don't. So it's just a weird like way that enemies turn hostile. Um, probably the most interesting effect of this is that if you hit them with... Uh, the mind fire contagion and they become confused they turn hostile and it doesn't then count as a crime to kill them so if you want to assassinate someone in an area where you would be committing a crime to do so you can do that with mind fire as a combat spell i think this spell is trash obviously because it just takes forever to go off but as a pre-combat debuff it does have very strong debuffs i'm going to put it in d tier but i do think that these debuffs are strong enough that maybe it has some uses but i think generally you're better off just ignoring that this spell exists. Destructive Wave. Destructive Wave kind of breaks my tier list system, honestly, because I've been doing these tiers based on how often you want to learn or prepare the spell. And Destructive Wave is only available as a domain spell to Light and Tempest clerics, so they always learn it and always have it prepared, so you never have to make the decision of whether you're going to learn or prepare the spell or not. So I'll be judging it, I guess, based on how often you're going to cast it compared to your other level 5 spell options. And the answer is uh, pretty frequently. So Destructive Wave is a 30-foot radius uh, AoE centered on you that does 5d6 thunder damage and 5d6 radiant damage, so two pretty relevant damage types, um, with a con save for half damage, and if they fail the con save, they get knocked prone. 
Um, knocking enemies prone in a big AoE is pretty good. Uh, the damage types, the damage is not amazing, obviously, for a level 5 spell, but the damage types are pretty relevant, because you can apply reverberation or radiant orbs, etc. Uh, and just, like, knocking over a bunch of enemies for a single action is not a bad action at all. And the fact that you always have access to the spell is quite relevant. It's big AoE. Uh, so it's just a nice spell to have access to. One thing about this spell is that the spell description lies. It says that it hits all creatures within 30 feet, but it doesn't. It doesn't hit allies. So you can uh, cast this in the middle of a group of enemies and allies who are all mixed up in melee. Uh, safely, it'll only knock over your enemies, and so, of course, that part is very good. Um, just a solid spell that you're going to use pretty often if you're a Tempest or Light Cleric. Highly recommend that you cast this. Obviously, you never have to decide whether you're taking it or not, but it's a great spell. A tier. Dispel Good and Evil. Dispel Good and Evil is a 10-turn self-buff, uh, not concentration, which does make it a little more interesting, that makes attacks from demons and celestials, fey, and undead have disadvantage against you, and also gives you an action that you can cast as a melee, um, cast in melee range, that removes charm, frightened, or possessed from an ally. Um, you can recast this every turn if they keep getting charmed, frightened, and possessed, uh, and the thing about this spell, of course, is that it is a purely defensive level 5 spell that does the same thing as Blur, a level 2 spell. Now, it's not concentration, so that's uh, nice, but it's also more situational because it doesn't work against every attack. Just getting disadvantage on attacks against you for a level 5 spell slot is a truly terrible use of a spell slot. Um, and the additional ability to break enemy, break allies out of these conditions does not fix the spell in any way, because there's much easier and cheaper ways to break allies out of these conditions, if that's even something that you want to do, which it usually isn't. I do not recommend casting this spell. D tier. Dominate Person. Dominate Person is a Concentration spell, 10 turn duration that you cast on a humanoid um, that forces them to fight as your ally. So you don't get control of them, but they will become allied to you and fight alongside you. However, every time they take damage, they get a new wisdom save to resist the effect, and it's a wisdom targeting effect. And, of course, it's a charm effect, so it's only usable against enemies that aren't immune to charm. Not that many humanoids are, but a bunch of them will be. So it, it's even narrower than just humanoids that, uh, as to who you can target with Dominate Person. Dominate Person, obviously, this is a very powerful disable effect because it completely swaps their sides. You know, you are, they are no longer attacking you and are now attacking the enemies. Although I will note that the AI being so bad at placing AoE spells and stuff like that means they'll often still harm your party. Um, and ally enemies will their former allies will attack them and break them out of this spell pretty easily. It's very inconsistent, and even if it goes off, how much better is it than hitting a big group of enemies with an AoE disable? It's the same problem as Dominate Beasts, uh, more reliable because, or more usable generally, because there's just more humans than there are beasts, but even still, it's not that powerful an effect, and it's very easy for them to escape from. Um, and it only targets one enemy, so I really don't think that you should be bringing Dominate Person typically. Uh, I'm going to place this in D tier. Flame Strike. Flame Strike is a damaging spell with a deck save for half that does 5d6 fire and 5d6 radiant in a 60 foot range, 10 foot radius. You can compare this pretty directly to Fireball, even though it's mostly not on the same classes, because Fireball is uh, also, if cast with a level 5 spell slot, 10d6 fire damage. So it would be the same damage in uh, more than twice the AoE, because it's double the radius. Flame Strike does have some advantages over Fireball in that it is split between Fire and Radiant, and that's good. Radiant's a relevant damage type and also generally a better damage type. Split damage is also typically better than all one kind of damage, even aside from Damage Rider Source stuff, which does uh, go off sometimes because this is two different damage instances according to the game. Um, and it can be cast it comes down from above the enemy that you cast, or the area you cast it on, so you don't need to be able to draw a direct line between you and the area compared to Fireball, which you have to actually throw, so it needs a direct uh, line of effect. Flame Strike will do an average of 35 damage with a deck save for half, which for a level 5 spell slot is just not very much damage, and I'm kind of hard-pressed to think of a character that gets Flame Strike that doesn't just have a better option for damage. Light Clerics get this as a domain spell, um, but of course that 
is competing with Destructive Wave and Fireball, both of which are way better. Um, and other versions of clerics have Spirit Guardians. So it's not like zero use for clerics, but most spell damage focused clerics just have way better spells that they can cast for spell damage. Um, Fiend Warlocks get this for free, but at the same, or get this as one of their additional spells, but they also get Cone of Cold, which is just a better spell overall. And so most of the characters that have access to this just have way better options for a damaging effect, if you even want a level five damaging spell, which just isn't that many characters that want a level five damaging spell. It's enough damage that I think I will put it in C tier, just because it has a couple cool things going for it, but honestly I could very easily be convinced to bump this down to D tier, and I think that you are generally better off not preparing Flame Strike unless you know you have a specific use for it, and most characters won't. Greater Restoration Greater Restoration, like the name says, is uh, le lesser restoration, but greater. It's kind of a combination of several lower level spells in that it breaks your allies out of um, diseases, poisons, stuns, uh, petrification, and so on. So it's kind of a, a curses, etc. So it's kind of a combination of lesser restoration, remove curse, and freedom of movement all rolled into a single spell. Is that good? No, not really. I mean, you're spending a level 5 spell slot for an effect that you could almost certainly get from a lower level spell slot. Uh, the only thing that this does that's qualitatively different than the lower level spells is that it can remove petrification, but in Baldur's Gate 3 that's not really a thing. The only use for this spell, or the only person who should be using and preparing this spell typically, is a life domain cleric who gets it as a domain spell. And in that case it can actually save you having to prepare lower level spells for things like freedom of movement, um, because you just already have this spell prepared for free and it's not costing you a spell preparation slot. Otherwise, I wouldn't recommend preparing or casting this spell because you're just spending a level 5 spell slot for something you could get from a much cheaper spell. No reason to do that D tier. Hold Monster. So Hold Monster is upgraded Hold Person, but it works on anybody. So just like Hold Person, it's a wisdom save uh, when... When you cast the spell, they get a wisdom save, and then they get another at the beginning of each of their turns. Otherwise, they are paralyzed. Paralyzed makes them unable to move or act or take reactions, and also guarantees critical hits from attacks made within 10 feet, which of course is an extremely powerful effect. Now, one thing that I should do is talk about Hold Person, because I mentioned in my uh, earlier that I was going to make some adjustments to my level 2 spell list, but haven't shown them to you yet because I wanted to do a video on one of the spells that I think was severely misevaluated by the community. That spell wasn't Hold Person, so I'm happy to just talk about that now and say that I think I did uh, underrate Hold Person because of its uh, utility as both a CC spell and a damage spell. Um, I had put it in B tier, and I'm going to be bumping it up to A tier. Um, the reason for that is that while it's slightly unreliable as a damage spell, because it relies on you having the correct initiatives to make use of the critical hits, and slightly unreliable as a crowd control spell because of the double saving throw issue, um, it's both of those things, and being that flexible and that powerful is really good. And of course, the, the ceiling on the spell is incredible, because you get several turns of crowd control, plus a lot of damage. I will also mention that the double saving throw issue is something that some people said they weren't having, um, that being that enemies who pass the second save at the beginning of their turn uh, still get their turn. And some people said that if they if they cast it on an enemy and they pass the second save at the beginning of their turn, they were skipping an action. So I went in and did some additional testing, because that was not consistent with my experience of the spell. And it seems like that's true for party members. When you cast Hold Person on a party member and they fail the second or they pass the second saving throw at the beginning of their next turn, they do still skip their action. But on enemies, they don't skip their action. Now, I haven't been able to test it on, like, every enemy type, and so if it is behaving appropriately for you and causing enemies to skip their action at their skip one turn after failing just the first saving throw, then the spell obviously gains a lot in utility because uh, currently, as of the way it's working in my observation, it basically gives enemies advantage on the saving throw, which is extremely weak. But um, if it's not doing that for you, if you're finding it consistently working after enemies fail just the first saving throw to cost them a turn, then it's a much better spell. We could bump Hold Person up to S tier. So just wanted to clear that up. I'd also appreciate if people take a moment to go test it in-game um, on an enemy, do this 
fresh, please don't use your memory. Actually go in and, and test it before you tell me uh, and see if how it's working for you so we can maybe try to build up a picture of what the issue is and whether it's inconsistent behavior or something and we can figure out what's going on there. Um, then that would be really helpful. Let me know in the comments. As to hold monster the spell itself, uh, is just being able to target anything with it worth having it be up three spell levels? And the answer is sometimes. I mean, this is still a great spell. It's just a very powerful effect that you can hit a lot of enemies with and you can hit non-human enemies with it. Many of the most dangerous enemies in the game are humans, but many of the most dangerous games enemies in the game aren't. And so being able to paralyze them and deal guaranteed crits is still very powerful. Most of the time, you're going to be using hold person because uh, a lot of combats are just against people and you won't be using hold monster against them. And I will say that hold person also has a much higher ceiling on the power level because one of the advantages of hold person is you can target multiple characters with it by upcasting it. Hold monster because it starts at level five. Well, you'd be hitting four people with hold person for a fifth level spell slot. Hold monster would only be hitting one. As it stands, I think that a single target CC for a level 5 spell, even with the um, extreme amounts of damage and the like, very high ceiling on this, is not an incredible spell action. Um, I think that this is probably, just because it's mostly superseded by Hold Person, going to be uh, landing in B tier. I think you could easily bump it up to A tier, because it's not that different from Hold Person, but it's three spell levels higher, so I'm going to put it in B tier. Um overall open to discussion and like I said let me know if you are seeing the same behavior that I'm seeing where enemies are getting their turn after passing the second save rather than skipping it. Insect Plague. Insect Plague is a concentration based 20 foot radius damage spell that creates difficult terrain and uh, does 4d10 of piercing damage with a constitution save for half, as well as giving enemies in the area disadvantage on perception checks. You can safely ignore that. It mostly doesn't matter unless you're doing a greater invisibility thing, in which case you probably don't have uh, Insect Plague up because that's going to start a fight. It does uh, exactly the same amount of average damage as Cloud of Daggers, the level 2 spell, because which does 22 average damage, because Insect Plague is yet another Baldur's Gate spell with completely inconsistent timing rules. Um, and so this one does damage when cast, it does the damage, but then it does uh, subsequent damage at the end of the creature's turn. So they're going to leave the AoE and almost certainly not take the second set of damage. Um, so this is probably going to average 22 damage. So as a damaging effect, you're going to get exactly the same amount of damage out of it as you, on average as you would out of Cloud of Daggers. Obviously, it's a much larger AoE, so it's going to hit more enemies, um, But and the difficult terrain is relevant, but it also has a con save for half, whereas Cloud of Daggers has no save. You can probably see where I'm going with this. If you're spending your concentration and a level 5 spell slot, you really had better be getting more than Cloud of Daggers worth of damage out of it. Um, and difficult terrain is the worst possible crowd control effect. You could get it without concentration and a much stronger one with plant growth. Um, just Or, you know, you could use Sleet Storm or something if you actually wanted to CC enemies. The amount of damage that this does is extremely marginal, and it is almost certainly always worse than casting Hailstorm, which will knock enemies over and create difficult terrain, as well as just doing more damage uh, initially. Um, and then you know, enemies will never take the subsequent damage from Insect Plague, so it doesn't matter, unless you've got them trapped in place, in which case it doesn't really matter what you're casting on top of them. Bad spell, the numbers just don't work out, Insect Plague is D tier. Mass Cure Wounds. Mass Cure Wounds uh, basically casts an up-leveled Cure Wounds on everyone within 60 feet of you, so it does 3d8 of healing to every ally within 60 feet. Now, hitting every ally within 60 feet is much more appealing than Cure Wounds, because Cure Wounds is melee. Um, and so for in-combat healing, being ranged is obviously a huge advantage, and the fact that it's AoE, so you'll heal the person that you want to heal while also getting a little value on the rest of your allies, is relevant. However, it's just 3d8 of in-combat healing. Spending your action in a level 5 spell slot on healing in combat is bad. Um, it's completely superseded by Prayer of Healing or Warden of Vitality or whatever for out-of-combat healing as well as just being completely uh, 
completely pointless for in-combat healing, mostly compared to healing word or just throwing potions, or any of the other efficient ways that you can heal in combat when you need to. This spell, the numbers, again, just are not there. I think if it did... I'm trying to think, again, what would be good numbers on mass cure wounds. If it did maybe 8d8 of healing in an AoE, so it actually like healed your whole party back up to full for a, a spell slot, um, or you know came close to doing that, then it would be kind of an interesting spell, because you could spend a 5th level spell slot on healing for full out of combat, or a 5th level spell slot on undoing an enemy AoE or something like that, and that, that would be kind of cool, as is obviously the numbers are just too low and you should never cast this spell. Planar Binding. Planar Binding is Dominate Person for uh, Celestials, Demons, Elementals, and Fae. Um, so it's a decent number of targets, but not undead, unlike some of the other things that affect like, only non-human targets, so you can't dominate an undead with it. It is works exactly the same, where you they make a wisdom save, and then they get another wisdom save every time they take damage, and you gain control of them. It has exactly the same problems as Dominate Person, where it's just an extremely inconsistent effect. Um, these are slightly less common, though still pretty common, so it's not like you won't fight any of these enemies. There's a decent number of demons and stuff in Act 3, um, so you can definitely get some value out of this. This can also be used to cheese some effects out of the the vendor, who's a djinn, because you can use planar binding on him to like move him around and stuff, and that, that I think does have some exploits associated with it. Uh, other than that, this is just exactly the same as Dominate Person, but for a slightly different set of targets, has all the same problems as Dominate Person, and is still D-tier as a result. Seeming. Seeming is a concentration-based day-long spell that affects your whole party and casts Disguise Self on them. Uh, it's exactly the same as Disguise Self, only it's concentration-based and it's not a ritual. Uh, and so it's going to cost you your 5th level spell and your concentration in order to disguise three more people. To add insult to injury, Baldur's Gate almost never cares if multiple party members are disguised, so not only are you spending way more resources on this, uh, you're also almost never using its actual advantage, because Disguise Self almost never comes up outside of conversation, and in conversation, only the character who's actually talking affects any of the checks in conversation, so you only care if that character is disguised. Um, as a sidebar, that is my least favorite design decision in Baldur's Gate, the fact that only the one character can be involved in conversations at a time, and if you're trying to talk about, like, uh, identify a relic of Mistra or something, and her ex-boyfriend is standing right next to you, he can't tell you that that's the thing that you're trying to identify, even when he's right there. Drives me berserk, and it's kind of inexplicable that they won't even let your other characters make skill checks in conversation when those come up, let alone actually pitching into the conversations. Um, just a really irritating design decision, and one of the few real friction points I have with this game, uh, which uh, obviously you know, I've spent hundreds of hours playing and think it's excellent, but that one is pretty baffling and irritating. Every time I talk about design decisions with the game, I always get people crawling out of the woodwork to tell me why it's good, actually, so uh, I can say, save your typing hands, you will not change my mind on this point. <laughs> Anyways, uh, seeming doesn't do anything, um, it's uh, duplicated by a free ritual, and uh, you do not want to spend your concentration and a level 5 spell slot on a spell that you get for free in about 800 ways, so we are obviously rating it D tier. Telekinesis. Telekinesis is one of the weirder spells in Baldur's Gate, um, and it's implemented extremely differently from how it is in Tabletop, where you can use it to actually like pick up things and hold them up in the air. Since there's no up in the air in Baldur's Gate, um, they you can't lift something up into the air and leave it there, which is one of the major uses of the spell, right, is to hold an enemy helplessly up in the air where they can't reach you in melee. Uh, so they've implemented it in Baldur's Gate as basically giving you the throw action with your character at range with no weight limit. So that is kind of interesting. It's the default throw action that every character has. It takes your concentration, and enemies get a strength saving throw against your save DC in order to resist the the effect. There's a couple uh, things that this lets you do. One, because you can throw enemies from a range, you can throw enemies who are above you down to your level, which is normally you would have to be able to get up to that uh, level in order to shove or throw them off the, the cliff. Um, and since they are up high up, they'll take additional falling damage on the way down. Two, you can throw 
uh, creatures perpendicular to your direction of movement. And three, you can throw allies, which can be very useful if you need to move an ally into an area, although they will fall prone if you hit an enemy with them. So you need to be a little bit careful with that. One of the neat side benefits this lets you do is actually telekinetically reposition your Guardian of Faith, which we talked about in the last episode. Um, you can actually throw that at enemies, which is kind of neat. One other weird thing about how telekinesis works is that if you cast the spell on an enemy and they pass the initial strength saving throw, it's kind of the opposite of cloud kill. You just lose the spell and aren't spell slot and aren't concentrating on it. You don't get to recast it. Normally you can concentrate on it for 10 turns and recast it every 10 uh, every turn for 10 turns, but if you try to cast it on an enemy and they pass the initial strength saving throw, you've just wasted the spell slot completely and don't get the opportunity to recast it. You can work around this somewhat if you have time to pre-buff before combat by casting telekinesis on an object, which you're guaranteed to succeed on, and then regardless of whether enemies succeed on subsequent strength saving throws, you always get the recast option, but it's it's uh, buggly will remove your ability to use telekinesis a second time if they pass the first saving throw. Is being able to throw an enemy at range and with no weight limit good? Um, not really. I mean, repositioning characters is really strong, of course, and there's definitely some uses for this spell, but as a damage spell it's lacking because the way that damage is calculated by throwing is mostly based on height, not on weight, so throwing enemies into one another won't do a ton of damage. As a crowd control spell, it's kind of lacking because it's just knocking two enemies prone, um, and that's reasonable but not amazing. Uh, it's a strength saving throw so a lot of the enemies you want to reposition are going to have decent strength saving throws regardless. It takes your concentration and a level 5 spell slot. I'm going to rate this C tier because I think there are some cool uses for it and there's probably some builds you can you can create around it. This is one I do want to revisit uh, that use the throwing effect to do damage just like you would with a throwing barbarian. Overall though as a generic spell that you're going to cast regularly. It's just not going to have that many uses. Its best use is for pulling enemies on ledges down to your level, and for that there are just better spell effects, I think, overall, or you could just misty step up to them and just fight them where they are, because um, it's 60 foot range, so you can always misty step to that area regardless, and if you, even with a wizard, you could use misty step plus thunder wave or misty step plus gust of wind in order to throw them off the ledge. Um, if you're able to get them to fail a strength saving throw regardless. So it's not a, a spell that is going to have a lot of utility outside of maybe some broken builds that specifically use the throwing interaction. So C tier spell, uh, I can't say that I have come up yet with a build that does that, but I will be probably revisiting this one as well to see if I can. Always one of the fun things about doing this spell list is it makes me look at spells in new ways and go, hey, maybe there's something interesting there that I should revisit later. Wall of Stone. Wall of Stone is another wall spell, like Wall of Fire, where you draw a straight line between two points and create a wall in the area. It has the same targeting issues that Wall of Fire has, where any bumps or variation in terrain or any even small objects can get in the way, and it's even slightly worse than Wall of Fire because, unlike Wall of Fire, it can't be cast on top of creatures, so it does need a pretty specific area or terrain variation in order to be able to effectively cast the spell. What it does is create a series of 30 health pillars, um, which have immunity to psychic damage and vulnerability to thunder damage, uh, but no other damage resistances, which is kind of odd that it doesn't have damage resistance or harden hardness of any kind, because it's stone, you would think it would be sort of hard to break. Um, and these pillars block movement and line of sight. How good is the ability to wall an enemy off? Well, the answer is pretty good. While the AI will try to break these pillars, they often get confused, and so it, it, this is yet another way to break AI. And uh, this spell can be cast before combat starts to wall off an important enemy before you start uh, combat. You can also, of course, use this across doorways, just like any other effect that can block a doorway, and then it can stop enemies from entering doorways. Unlike Arcane Lock and stuff like that, it's not going to bug the AI out, because they are actually programmed to attack the Wall of Stone, and so this is much less exploitative than some of the other effects you can use to block doorways, like... Uh, Arcane Lock or Barrel Blocking or whatever, um, which often bugs out the AI. Wall of Stone, in my experience, mostly doesn't. It's Concentration, which is also a little weird because it's uh, a Wall of Stone, but it doesn't have any... Because um, 
you know, it's just a big block of stone. But it doesn't have any duration, so you can keep it up forever if for some reason your combat goes longer than 10 turns. You get to continue concentrating on Wall of Stone. Overall, I would say that this spell comes up in a couple combats where you can wall off an important enemy and uh, take down the rest of the enemies. I, I, this is a spell I like personally, but I do have to say that it is not one that's going to come up super frequently in various combats, and so I'm going to rate it C tier. I think there are some encounters that it will totally solve because you can lock an enemy in a corner. You should always look for corners where you can draw a line that actually completely encloses one enemy. Um, if they're standing near the corner of two actual walls, then you can create a, thir a triangle with the third wall and, and seal them off. And in which case it can buy you several turns of being hard CC. Uh, this is, again, not the most powerful spell in the game, but it can often buy you a few turns of respite, which you can use to heal up or whatever if you need it. And it can also be used to divide two groups of enemies in half in a way that doesn't start a fight. So you can do this ahead of the, the fight in order to... It, you can place this down ahead of a fight in order to gain an advantage in some encounters in the game, depending on the terrain. Not useless, and a spell that makes you feel really smart when you get good use out of it, so I like it for that reason as well, but also not the most powerful effect, C tier. Next up, I'm going to talk about the three secret spells. These you can only get through a certain story event. You find them as scrolls, and as a wizard, you can scribe these scrolls into your spellbook to have them castable later in the game. This is kind of the wizard power fantasy, where you get to find a secret spell nobody else gets access to, and use your many years of study and practice to learn this spell, somewhat undercut in Baldur's Gate by the fact that anybody can learn these spells with only a single level of wizard, so you don't actually have to be a wizard in order to cast to learn and cast these spells. These three spells are uh, Curriculum of Strategy, Artistry of War, Dethrone, and Sights of the Seely Summon Deva, and I will talk about each of them individually. First up, Artistry of War. So the first thing about Artistry of War is that you that you should know is that the tooltip is yet again completely lying to you. It says it does 18 to uh, 78 damage, and that's undershooting the damage by 30. This actually does 2d6 plus 6 times 6, so it is dealing a minimum of 48 damage and a maximum of 108 damage. Um, rather than a minimum of 18 and a maximum of 78. It's basically super magic missile. It fires six shots, each of which do 2d6 plus six force damage. They can't miss. There's no save. Uh, you can split them up as you choose. Obviously, this is a ridiculous amount of damage, and so even for a level five spell slot, this is still a really solid way to deal a bunch of damage, it being totally reliable, um, unresistable, and splittable up across multiple enemies is incredibly strong. I think a lot of people overlook this spell a little bit because the uh, tooltip lies, but the fact that it actually does way more damage than that, and it's just like exactly the same as Magic Missile as an incredible spell. This is an S tier spell and really, really strong. Um, if you have this and have it scrolled, it also scribed, um, it also, any character with a one level wizard dip can use this spell with impunity because it doesn't rely on your wizard save, spell save, since of course you are not, uh, it, it has no save and no hit roll or anything, so it doesn't matter what your intelligence is when you cast this spell. Um, just an incredible spell that does an incredible amount of damage. Dethrone is another damage spell, and this is an interesting one because it's a single target damage spell that has 90 foot range, so it is actually uh, longer range than every other single target damage spell in the game, basically. It does 10 d6 plus 20 necrotic damage with a con save for half, so it's decent but not amazing damage. I mean, it's it's better damage than just about everything else at level... Uh, uh, at, at level 5, but it has the disadvantage of being bugged, I assume, and always having 18 save DC, no matter what your character save DC is. If you learn this spell from a scroll, it's always going to have exactly 18 save DC, um, and so enemies at in the later halves of the game are almost always going to succeed on the constitution saving throw, because it's a bad, spell to tar bad save to target. Necrotic damage is a bad damage type. Um, the amount of damage this does is still good, so you'll get some use out of it against some enemies, but the fact that it's bugged out and has 18 save DC really does damage this spell's effectiveness. I'm going to put it in C tier because the cap on it is really good, right? If, if you uh, deal 80 damage with it, then that's a lot of damage, and the average damage is going to be uh, 55, which is pretty reasonable for a spell at this level. Um, 
but the amount of additional uh, hoops you have to jump through and the fact that the save DC is bugged does decrease the value of the spell massively. Finally, uh, Sights of the Seelie Summon Deva lets you, uh, and I guess I should also, as a side note, I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Deva because it is, I believe, a Sanskrit loan word that was stolen for D&D. But if you are a native Hindi speaker or another language that is uh, has Sanskrit roots, uh, let me know how you would say it because I'm interested in learning that pronunciation. This is a time when I'm calling for people to try to correct my pronunciation, so for those of you who've been waiting to do that, now's your chance. Um, anyways, Summon Deva lets you summon the level 6, the, the Deva, which is exactly the same as the level 6 cleric spell uh, as a level 5 spell. Obviously, that's really good. Is it better than a bunch of other summons? I don't know, because the Deva is not like the most amazing summon in the world. It's just damaging and tanking. But the fact that you get a level 6 spell for a level 5 spell does make this spell pretty solid. I think this has to be an S-tier spell because it is a level 6 spell that you get as a level 5 spell, and that's an enormous reduction in resource usage, obviously. You get to use this spell for... Um use this spell using a much cheaper resource. Though I am not a huge fan of the Deva as a summon, because it only has plus 8 to hit with its attacks, meaning it's going to miss pretty regularly in combat, and it only gets a single attack. Um, so it's not like the best fighter in the in the game, but just the fact that it has 136 hit points and 21 AC does make it a much more powerful tank, and of course you can use it to block up uh, areas and everything. I think that you won't be honestly leaving like a tremendous amount of power on the table casting one of your other level 5 spells, but also the fact that this just isn't competing with a lot of other great spells at level 5 I think makes it an S tier spell. I should also mention actually just before we get off of the secret spells here that the Staff of Cherish Necromancy does change the rating on Dethrone because it's bugged and lets you cast Necromancy spells for free. Uh, although because it's on a short rest cooldown, all these secret spells are on enforced short rest cooldowns. You can't just spam Dethrone forever the way you might otherwise be able to. Alright, let's take a look at all of the level 5 spells and see if we can come to some conclusions about this. One thing that you'll notice, obviously, is that the level 5 spells, except for the secret spells, have averaged very poor ratings from me. Um, all the C-tier spells are, are castable and usable, but overall, level 5 is not an impressive spell level in Baldur's Gate. The reason for this is the design sensibilities of level 5 spells are that they should break physics or break the narrative of... Dungeons and Dragons, and those aren't things that the game, because it's a video game, can actually let you do. A level 5 spell like Teleportation Circle or whatever obviously can't exist in uh, in Baldur's Gate because long distance teleportation is provided by fast travel mechanics anyways. So something that would be narratively extremely critical in a tabletop game doesn't work in Baldur's Gate as a mechanic in the game. With that uh, without those options, level 5 spells are left with a lot of damage spells, which are, have a cap on how good they can be, because a damage spell needs to actually kill something to relevantly contribute to the combat. And because a lot of these damage spells don't come with additional utility, they are... Uh, significantly weakened compared to damage spells at other levels. That said, there's still some real hits, and of course the Conjure Elemental is the biggest hit out of the level 5 spells, um, and one that you should be making use of extensively. Most of the time your level 5 spells are going to be upcast in lower level spells, which is a trend that we, of course, were expecting when we looked at higher level spell slots. All right, my friends, I hope that you've enjoyed this look at the level 5 spells, and of course, if there's anything you think I've misplaced, do let me know in the comments below, and you can feel free to uh, like the video, leave a comment, both of those things help a ton with the algorithm, and you can subscribe to my channel for more of this and other strategy game content. Cheers, folks. I'll catch you next time.